All right, any questions about inheritance, uh, uh, how we um, initialize uh, the uh, base class, uh, how we can overwrite the base class's functions, uh, what is the difference between override and overload, and virtual functions. Any questions on these? I'm going to go through them very quickly, but if you have any questions, I need to know so I can actually refer to those with more emphasis. No? All right. Um, uh, while we are doing this, make sure if you're sitting at a computer, your computer, your uh, local computers are on because you have to sign in. You know that. So your local computer, the computer that you have on it, either in front of you or beside you, you need one of the lab computers to be on, logged in with you, and potty loaded. So while we are doing, make sure you have that. On your local computers, on your lab computers, turn them on, log in, go to my apps, say yes to whatever message comes up, and start putty, okay? Make sure you do that. Because when we start the test, you need that to prove you're in class. Otherwise, okay. So, so we said that inheritance is essentially reusing uh, an already existing class to build something new. We had a class we called it animal in this, oh, you had a question. One more time. At any point, can you use the scope resolution operator to like access, like uh, I guess like a base class or a derived class, like uh, member. So, what is the difference between scope resolution and the dot that actually? <laughs> uh, so let's see what is the difference between the scope resolution to access a member uh, operator or a member variable or the scope resolution, the, the scope resolution or the dot. What's the difference? The dot re refers to the object. So if you have an object of a class, so if I have an animal and I create an animal, call it A. If I want to access the property act of the animal, I have to say A dot act. But if I'm inside the animal methods and I want to use other methods of the same class, not outside. If you're inside a class and you want to use the properties inside the class, then a scope resolution is your friend. Okay? So that's what it is. It's as easy as that. So if you are inside the animal and you say animal scope resolution act, it means go to the action of mine. It's like saying this arrow. Okay? Now, in inheritance, we use the scope resolution because we have hierarchy of classes, which means if you are in a car class that is made out of vehicle and you want to access the vehicle inside a car because you are inside the class, then you have to say vehicle scope resolution brake, for example, to stop the car because any vehicle has a brake and therefore all the car, cars will have a brake. So the action of brake in a car can be accessed using scope resolution because you are inside the class. But if I create a car, car called Fardad's Honda, for example, if I had a Honda. So now if I want to make Fardad's car to stop, I have to say Fardad's car dot brake because now I have an object. So if you have an object and want to access the properties of the object, you use the dot. If you are inside a class and you want to use other property of the same class or its parents, you use scope resolution. Okay? So that was the answer to that, and we're going to see it in action right now. Okay. So we gave example using an animal, and we say an animal of mine can act and move and make a sound, and it has a destructor, and we did all the good stuff that we had over there, and then we created a, a cat out of that, and we said, how do we create a cat? We said, when to create a cat, I have to say class cat, then I put a, a column and public animal in front of it. This means is a, as you see, a cat, yes.
Pardon me? Too white. Let me see if I can actually. Oh, is it good now? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So, um, as I was saying over here, to say a cat is an animal, at the line you create the class, you put a column and you put public. For now, public is the only way we can do inheritance. There are two more ways to do inheritance, privately or protective, uh, protectively, if I can actually call it that way. You can, but in, that's too rich for our blood. Only public we do. So if you want to say cat is an animal, you're going to say clat cast, cat, public animal, which means a cat is an animal, and then you put all the is a relationship, uh, has a relationship as the properties of that. And for that, we created a, a car thingy, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, in a previous session. We created, uh, for inheritance syntax, we created the bicycle and a class engine, and we said a motorcycle is a bicycle with an engine. So this is, has a relationship. In here, this is, is a relationship. So a motorcycle is a bicycle that has an engine. Okay? So a motorcycle, I can actually put it like this. Oh, not like that. I can actually put it like this. So we said, we say a motorcycle is a bicycle that has, has an engine, okay? That's the syntax and the meaning of it. Is a relationship is happening over here at the line you are creating a class. Has a relationship is the property. It could be a class, it could be a primitive type or anything you want. It does not make any difference. So I'm going to save this over here too. So I'm going to say A is a has a dot CPP to understand what is is a has a relationship. So we said that the constructor of cat over here, the constructor of the derived class will receive whatever property it needs when you are in a uh, uh, creating the class, designing the class out of animal. You could override, you could override a class's uh, uh, override basis act, okay? Or you can create new one. Now, if you wanted to, like for example, let's say a uh, um, a cat has uh, two sounds, a sound like this and a sound that accepts over here num, number of times it's going to make the sound. This one overrides basis sound this one overloads basis sound. Got it? Override has the exact signature of the parent. So if I actually look at the parent's animal, the, the, the animal that is the parent, if I look at it over here, sound has that signature, this sound has this signature. Now if I want to, for example, write this one, maybe I want to uh, create it something like this and say when you, when uh, if I want to do that, I'm going to say for i uh, integer i set to zero, i less than num, uh, c out meow. How do you write meow? Is that meow? This is how you write meow? I don't know. Meow, and then <clears throat> uh, i plus plus. and then C out and L, okay? So, so, so 
So regarding to inheritance, if we look at it, the sound over here overrides basis sound. This sound that accepts an integer has nothing to do with the parent. It overloads the parent sound. And this one is a creating, it creates a new action, a new uh, method that the parent doesn't have. Yes. If it's the same thing as the parent, it's override. Okay? If it's completely new one, it's just a new action. If it's the same name as the parent with different signature, that's an overload. Okay? Obviously, I could have over here an integer with a default value. If you have that one, then it's overload and override. So if I have integer sound, so if I had something like this over here instead, then it overload and override because it has a default value, then default, or, or I'm going to put over here one. If it has a default value, it means it overrides the parents, and when you give it a, give it a value, then it overloads the parents, okay? Uh, but I'm not going to put that one instead, like too many things to go through, I don't want to do. So that's how we override. And then we said, when doing something like this, problem happens. What is the problem? The problem is that if we do something like this and we, and we use, uh, and we call someone with their last name, we said, if I actually have an animal over here and in my main, instead of calling the animal, uh, sorry, calling the cat directly, I use an animal pointer or a reference, then the object forget, the, the class forgets being a cat. It becomes an animal. So in object orientation, when you do inheritance, if your, if your derived class is referred to using the parent's pointer or reference, then it forgets being derived. It changes, goes back to exactly what parent was. That's sometimes desired. If that's the case, you do it, depending on business logic. If in your business logic you do not want any object to be referred to by parents, pointer, or reference, then this is your way. Do it. But sometimes you don't want that. As I mentioned, I said my father used to teach mechanics. So if this is true, you tell me, Mr. Soleiman, who teach, instead of C++, I'll forget that I'm a C++ teacher. I'm going to start teaching mechanics because that's my parents' teaching. You t in order to make me teach you C++, you have to say, Fardad, teach C++. Otherwise, I will forget being Fardad. I'll be the Mr. Shuli Manlu, that is my father. Got it? Sometimes that's desirable. So I would say, when, I, when we go to the mechanics class, call me Mr. Shuli Manlu. Mr. Shuli Manlu. When we come to C++, call me Fardad. We're good then. But if that's not the case, and I'm only to teach C++, then you have to make sure my father's teaching is not the real one. The real one is my teaching that is C++. To do that, you must make the parent's action an unreal action. What is the meaning of unreal in English? Virtual. So to make sure that if you have a child, to make sure if you have a child, and that child of yours, to make sure that if you have a child and that child of yours is pointed by a parent's reference or a pointer, but that doesn't change anything and always the latest version of the action is called, you have to make the basis action virtual. So in this case, as you see at line 10, Virtual Void Act guarantees that if your child has an act method, that will be called if the child is pointed, referred to by its family name. If the child is referred to by parents, pointer, or reference, it's guaranteed that the latest version of act will be called. It's guaranteed that the latest version of sound will be called because they are virtual. But move is not virtual, which means 
if you use parents' name to a child and say move, they're not going to move like a child anymore. They're going to move like a parent. And because of this fact that having a method virtual guarantees that the latest version of that thing is being called from now on to the last day you are programming C++, every single destructor that you create must be virtual. It doesn't matter if you want to inherit it or not, just make it a rule for yourself. I create a destructor, it is virtual. Okay? Not only that, if you create a class that that class doesn't require uh, a destructor, that class doesn't have any resources, so you don't need, need to apply rule of three. But you don't know if their children are supposed to do that, Therefore, if your class even doesn't need a destructor, create an empty destructor and make it virtual. So create a destructor, make it virtual, and go implement it in implementation, leave the body empty. Have a destructor, make it virtual, nothing in it. So if you do not need a virtual, if you do not need a destructor in a class, create it anyway, make it empty and make it virtual to guarantee if somebody inherits from yours there is no memory leak if they create if they point to a child using a pointer to try to delete it it's going to delete everything because you made the destructor virtual that's one of the things that you wonder um, actually no it's okay so that's that are we okay with this okay we talked about global stuff and how the Boolean debug over here is actually global using extern. I didn't talk about utils the other day. We created the class. Did I talk about the utils thingy and it's, and it's being? No. So if you look at utils, the new version of utils that I have in here, I have no idea why is it here. Oh, it's correct. Why the CPP file is here? Go to source. There you go. So if you look at the utils file, my utils is not like the one that you had in workshops in here. This utils is object oriented as a class. So the util class of mine has lots of different functions over there that you can use if you want to, okay? So it has all the things that the uh, string header file has and little things from st standard library and uh, trimming and like the lowercase string copy and uh, cool stuff like that. So there are many things over here that you can actually use. Uh, but the thing is that this one it is a class actually. And those are the methods of a class. So if that's the case, at any moment you want to use utils, you have to instantiate it. Otherwise, you don't have access to the classes, to the thing. So what did I do? In the utils.cpp over here, I did that for you. So I created a utils object called it UT. That's not the University of Toronto. That's UT utilities, right? So now this utils is instantiated. I need to give access to you, make that thing global, that file scope. So what do I do? I'll go to utils.h and I'm going to say extern utils ut, which means now at any, in any file you include my utils.h, you can use the ut object because it's instantiated and it's global. And that's exactly how you have access to see in and see out. C in is an object of iStream instantiated in iStream.cpp and globalized in, in iostream.h. Okay? And C out the same. C out is an instance of OStream that is instantiated in iostream.cpp and globalized by, with an extern in iostream.h. And that's how you make a file scope variable really global. Are we okay down to this point? Now, down to this point, everything is fine and dandy. Okay? So we learned what virtuals are and how they work and why do we need them. And that brings us to the next thing that I want to talk about. Sometimes when you create a class, you know that class is supposed to do something, but still you don't know how. For example, do we all agree that humans can talk 
a human being can talk or a human being can speak. Are we okay with this? Human beings can speak. Can you tell me how a human being actually speaks? Can you give me an example of human being speaking? The answer is no. You have to know if the human being is Arab, is a human being is English, is, is the person is Chinese, is it Chinese speaking Cantonese or Chinese speaking Mandarin or many different dialects that you can find in China or Indian. Whoa, don't go for languages in India because your head's going to spin. Okay, so the, 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 the dialects. Are, so you can, we all agree that human beings can speak. But unless you derive that human being to an Indian human being and then take that Indian human being into, can, can, can some Indian person give me an example over here? Punjabi. Punjabi Indian, Punjabi Indian human beings, and then Punjabi has what language? Punjabi. Punjabi. So there you go. So that's the that's the finish. So now if I have a Punjabi Indian human being, now I can implement speaking because now it's gonna. I know that person is gonna speak uh, in Punjabi. Are we okay with this? And sometimes this is in some levels true and some levels false. Let's assume in China we only speak Mandarin and Cantonese. Let's assume that. So I'm going to have a human being, and I'm going to say Chinese human being, right? Now I want to implement speak and write. Speak I can't do, because Cantonese and Mandarin are spoken in a different way. But writing I can do, because they are written in the same way. Am I right? No? No? I, they told me that's right. They, they told me that Cantonese and, and Mandarin are written the same way but spoken differently, if I, re, if I recall correctly. Am I right? So similar writing but different speaking. That's what I'm saying. So when you say Chinese dot write, that doesn't need to be uh, uh, done later. You can finish it. But then you have to do Chinese Cantonese, then it's going to be speaking can be actually modified then. So the level of where you are defining certain thing is different in the hierarchy. Do we understand that? Okay? Sorry, I, 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 it is a, my Chinese friends tell, tell, tell me that. So I just repeat there, there's the, if, if I'm no expert in languages whatsoever. So, so yeah. Uh, anyways, um, so. Uh, so that's the case. If that's the case, I know that human must have a method called speak. It must. It is impossible a human being cannot speak. Even if they cannot speak, they have sign language. So some kind of speaking happens. So I need a human being have speak method, but I cannot implement it. How can I do that? I cannot leave it empty. If I leave it empty, they can actually call it because an empty method can be called. I want to enforce speaking's implementation in future derivatives of humans, in future implementation of humans. I want to enforce it. For me, a human being cannot exist if they cannot speak. How can I enforce this? It is done with a special virtual function. So the function is virtual, but it doesn't have implementation. So what you do, you write virtual, so human, then you write virtual speak equals to zero. In the prototype, when you write equal to zero, it means a human must speak. I don't know how yet then you have to derive human in a new human being, that is Indian, and then derive that one to Punjabi. Then you have to, then at that moment, you can actually implement the speak virtual function. So if I have an object of Punjabi human being, and I refer to it with a human pointer, now I can actually call speak, and the latest version will be called that is Punjabi. And in my case, the latest version will be called, I don't know, probably Farsi, okay? 
All right? So that's, that's what's going to happen, right? Now, so pure virtual methods are a wish list of things that must be done later in a class. So essentially, it gives you the power to design your class, to have your idea in a class, but not implement it. Let other people who are inheriting your class to do it, to enforce your design. Okay, so how does that happen? So now, my animal over here, as you see, it has a sound. I have no idea how the sound is supposed to be made. So I make it equal to zero. Then, when I create a cat, I implement it to meow, and when I have a dog, I implement it to woof. So, because of this fact, an animal with this design is not a complete class. It has unimplemented methods. It has pure virtual methods. Because of this, they call these types of classes abstract base classes. A class that at least has one pure virtual method, you cannot instantiate it anymore. You cannot say animal A now, like you did before. Because it says, hey, your class is incomplete. First inherit it and imp implement all the pure virtual methods, then you can instantiate the children. The parent is only an idea. If I told you, if you are the best sculptor in the world, you are Michelangelo, and I tell you to sculpt a human being's figurine, you can't do it because you don't know if it's female or male. There are undone properties that you did not. Gender is a f pure virtual method. You have to inherit it further to see what the gender is and implement it. Then you can sculpt a human being then when that part is actually implemented. Do, do, are we okay with this? It's the same thing over here. So any class that holds a pure virtual method is called an abstract base class. Now for C++, abstract base class is abstract base class. They're all the same. No difference. You can have a class that has only pure virtual methods. It is only an idea and nothing is implemented in it, okay? That from C++ is the same thing as a class who has only one pure virtual method and 50 other implemented methods. But there is a special name. There is a special name for a class who has only pure virtual methods in an object-oriented terminology. They call that an interface. An interface is essentially a gateway to build a class. It has no implementation in it. It's just a wish list. It's as if Come on. So An interface looks like this. I have an animal. An animal can act, move, make a sound. And obviously, I create a, pure virtu uh, a virtual destructor that is empty. So the only implemented thing over here is an empty destructor. The rest, so if I look at the animal.cpp, there is nothing in here. Actually, there is something in there, which, is, which makes it very cool. But we'll see it. Oh, so as you see over here, it's like that. Um, in the next one, I'm going to talk about it. So now my animal, as you see, has nothing. Right? So now I would say, but I have a pet that is actually made out of an animal. That is made out of an animal. I know how it moves. Okay? But I don't know how it's going to act. 
You don't need to make this virtual. I just put over here, for example, and, uh, because if you look at, uh, let me just take a look at animal. An animal has everything virtual over here, right? Any function that is virtual makes all the functions that overwrite it virtual. So if I look at pet over here, that is an animal. Let's take a look at the, uh, split the window. So in here, I have an animal, and as you see, I have a pet. Pet has a name, it has a constructor, it has the accessors that I want, and it has a move and a sound. It does not implement the act. So pet is still an abstract base class. It implemented some of the animal stuff, but it's not complete yet. So it's the first step in implementation. Some things pets can do, but I don't know everything else yet. So I implement some of it. Now if you want a pet, after that you can actually implement it further in, uh, say, a cat. So my cat over here can uh, implement, oh, no, cat CPP, cat H actually, yeah. So my cat over here uh, implements the app, doesn't implement the move, so the cat's move comes from the pet, but the sound and act are overwritten. So everything else remains the same. And you can keep going like that. If I actually look at the hierarchy of the classes that I have over here, they're going to look like something like this. I have an animal. Animal is inherited into a pet. And pet is inherited to a cat. And that, ladies and gentlemen, we call them uh, uh, abstract based classes. Yes. I double clicked on it. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So, uh, in your, uh, so what happens, so now you ask, it's actually a good question. Uh, visual Studio, Visual Studio Installer. That's actually a good thing. That, so, I want to actually show it to you. Uh, so you have to have visual, you have to, uh, visual studio installer. So open visual studio installer. And in your uh, visual studio installer, you need to go to, um, So let me just, I'm going to modify 2022 to show you what, what's going on. So to be able to have that, if you, are, if you have installed the enterprise version, it comes with it. But if you install the community version, you have to go to individual components and scroll down to code tools and install class designer. Okay? So when you install class designer, that tool comes with it. That class designer gives you that uh, capability to be able to, to actually, uh, so what you do, you go to your solution explorer and you simply drag the class and you drop it in here and automatically it's going to draw the, the, uh, the hierarchy for you. So you know that cat is a pet and pet is an animal and exactly what methods they have, what fields they have and so on and so forth. Are we good with this? Okay. So. These are, so now we have an interface, so that's everything's good down to this point. Now let's see what are, oh, did I close everything? Oh, I close everything. I close everything. Just a second, I'm going to reopen it. Give me two seconds, please. So, so now, let's see what benefits this action will, uh, what benefits this thing will have for us. Why do we like this? And, oh, it's 11.34. The class ends at 11.35, right? So, yeah, so in one minute I'm going to end it. And anyways, this is the next week's lecture. So. Abstract based classes stuff next week. So I'm just going to show you a little thing over here and we'll be done.
add existing project. I want to see if this is the one, if it's not. So now, as you see, I actually expanded my animal kingdom over here. And if you look at your animals over here, they, are, they look like something like this. I don't know why. Not that. Sorry, it, it's, it's building. Visual Studio 2022 has lots of bug. I don't know why it's... Anyways, oh, it came up. When you close it, it comes up. Uh, let me see if I can open it again. Oh, there you go. Okay, so I have to move it to repaint it. So as you see, an animal, pet, cat, bird, goldfish, budgie. So this animal kingdom is made for you to take a look at. And also, I just want to check something in animal.cpp. Oh, there is no animal that's here. Anyways, so I'll talk about it the next day we are coming in. I don't want to rush you in it. But uh, you now you know. Please, I'm going to remove the, the seven. I don't want you to go through things that I didn't talk about. So I'm going to remove this. I'll remove it when you're doing the test. And I'm going to post the thing after. So please go through all these things and... Uh, uh, test them, run them, walk through them, see how they, things get executed, modify them, make it not compile and fix it. That's how you're going to learn. Yes? Every interface is always what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> any any abstract-based class. Oh, it was a beautiful question, everyone. Don't discuss the thing, please. Okay. Uh, the question was, is it safe to say that an interface is always parent of some other class? Yeah, that's why we call it interface. And also abstract-based classes, same thing. Any class that has a pure virtual method, one or many pure virtual method, the only purpose is to be inherited. Otherwise, they're useless. Got it? All right. Now I'm going to prepare the test and stop the recording. Get ready, and when the test starts, everybody...